only learned about the term pink noise like two years ago, and obviously I'm familiar with white noise, as a lot of people might be, as kind of background noise, and often it's thought of as something that you're supposed to shut out or ignore, but that, that's, that's kind of around the periphery, and that often white noise will be man-made noise, so it's the hissing of a radiator, static on the radio, and that pink noise is uh, often found in nature, whether it's um, the wind going through the trees or the like ebb and flow of the ocean. Sometimes people will put that on a sound machine and there's kind of a soothing quality to it. And so I was trying to connect the senses there and think of how, how that can be conveyed visually as opposed to, you know, um, auditorily. With Peter's work, I thought it's interesting that there is this, obviously you're a man, so it's man-made, but that you're playing with visual distortion that exists in nature. You know, if you're looking at water through a glass or if there's a straw in it and the way that, that can be distorted. And in, in Blair's case, I felt like it was more in taking shapes like the, the, ra the kind of rainbow racetrack, for instance. You know, racetracks, we think of them, we kind of impose an artificial um, starting point and finishing line on them, but really they're all infinity loops. And so again, that there's kind of a, a, a connection to um, something beyond this world and that you're thinking about, you know, infinity loops, but that there's also kind of some biography or anecdotal evidence laden in, in both of them. And, and lastly, I would just say that John Armletter, who's not here today, is interesting, is kind of a bridge to me with the piece that he has between the two of you in that, Blair, I feel like some of your work can be a little bit more uh, from the real world, whether it's the kind of representation of, of speakers or, or the racetrack, and that, um, Peters tends to lean towards straight abstraction. And I feel like with the one John piece that we have in the show, that you have the couch kind of from the real world and then the abstract painting, that that's kind of a nice bridge between you guys. Now, just because we're sitting here, I'm curious, you were telling Peter and I a story about this painting, that this oh, has some, can, yeah. you, can, can you quickly tell us what's the kind of, hidden inspiration in this? Okay, I'll try to quickly, uh, quickly, might, uh, I'll go as fast as I can. I just want to cover the, uh, a couple of things. First, the noise. Okay. Then we'll get to the thing. And sure. Then the thing will be quick. But uh, something I love about it, it's a great honor for me to show with Peter because uh, a long story that I may get to at some point in the next 25 minutes or whatever. But uh, I'll get to that, but basically, the whole idea of white noise or pink noise for me was more uh, an issue of what happens with art when you, when, you, when you spend a long time making art, or even if you're just looking at it uh, as a young person going to museums and starting to think about it, there's a, you know, there's, let's say paintings if we want to get to a smaller subset, and then there's the human interaction. And I was thinking about white noise and then pink noise as the, the, the sort of cliche uh, example of that is the seashell, and then you, you listen to the seashell, and in theory you hear the ocean. But of course, you don't really hear the ocean, you hear the air between you and the, and the shell, and there's this kind of romantic idea that you turn that funny uh, air sound into the sound of the ocean. And I think that the, I know that I like to work kind of by myself and be sort of like a hermit off in my studio and work and I cut everything out. So that's a sort of white noise reference, I guess. But the, I like I'm, that. That's a beautiful description. What, what I'm, is, am I done now? No, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to quickly say that what it is is the, with art, and also it gets much richer as, as it gets longer and that gets to the, to the, to the Peter connection which I'm gonna stop and just let you talk in a second and then I'll, maybe I'll get to it. But basically, uh, you appreciate more and more the interaction between you, the people you know, the paintings, their relation to paintings. I like to do paintings about older paintings 
and it makes you think about you know someone like John who I've known forever or when I used to see Peter's work in, in 1986 or something in the East Village and the, in those days there were these uh, stretch limo uh, BMWs and there was this huge empty kind of bombed out lot and then Pat Hearn Gallery was there and it just brings me back uh, to that a little bit. So uh, associative, one last thing. It's associative, the thing that, that brings us together in my mind is that I, I see it as kind of associative abstraction, that, that, that yes, it's abstraction, but it's not sort of formal abstraction about color and shape. It, it actually is shapes that, that have associations. They make you think of things, they come from things, and that's a, that's a strong uh, tie-in. Also with arm letter, because he uses the furniture, and that's what makes it, that's kind of like him in, the, in what would otherwise be a formal abstraction. Peter, just to riff off of what Blair was saying, do you, how, how do you think about ab abstraction or deal with the, that, that well, term in regards to your there's paintings? There's light in my paintings. And so there is something other than, than abstraction going on there. You know, there is light and shadow. There always has been uh, in virtually everything I've done. Um, so it, it, is, it is a representation uh, of something, something that doesn't exist in the real world, but nevertheless, it, it is a picture as well as, as a painting. You Can know? you just, because we talked about that once, in your mind, what is the difference between a picture versus a painting? Um, a, a painting would be a, a, an object. Um, a, a picture uh, is a picture. Uh, is a visual. Yeah. And then one thing um, we had talked about, and I was interested to get Blair's take on this, is you were saying to me when we were in Paris a couple of months ago that you were working on some new paintings where you try to capture some heat in them. And I was wondering, do you think that your paintings, uh, of your paintings is having a temperature? Mm. I don't know, maybe. I mean, I think of, I try, I, I'll go even crazier and say I like to think that they have a soul. I mean, I, 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 I try to, you know, I think if you're really working on something and you, you want it to have like a lineage and an identity, and then I really think of work as going to, I don't really think of it as going to a museum. You know, you have to think realistically, what is a painting? And I always, my, my favorite thing is the idea that it goes into somebody's house and they and they are comfortable with it, and it it functions in some room, and it and it's part of their life, uh, part of their habit, eating or walking down the hall or whatever. So it has a ten, it has a pulse, let's say, hopefully. Okay, I only thought of that because the one silver painting almost looks like it has flames coming out of it, but. I don't know. I, 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 I don't know why. I, I, that's called tea dragon. I was just thinking about those old kites uh, that, that we used to have. When you when you stretch canvas, you have the you have these uh, sort of little teeth or whatever you call them, feathers, the ends of the of the canvas. Mm -hmm. And I, I liked them so much. I, I I was always stapling them to the back, and then I liked them when they were hanging out. And I decided to just you know not staple them. Peter, we were talking about, and, and I think Blair kind of referenced this a little bit with this painting. I don't know if you would be thinking of a cinematic mechanical <laughs> owl looking at this necessarily at first glance. Well, I mentioned it to you only because it, it is so rare for that to happen. Um, and, and this painting here was, um, it happened because of a challenge. I was sitting um, with a friend on his balcony in, in New York, and, and the clouds were very low. Lights were shining up at the clouds, and well, we, we were really stoned. And, um, and it was, oh, wow. And, uh, and Scott challenged me to, to paint that. And I think he was expecting me to take a very, very different approach. I, I never set out to paint something. They have a life of their own. They kind of paint themselves. So this was really an exceptional situation where I thought, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take him up on his challenge. And, um, and I nailed it. That's exactly what, what I saw from that balcony that night. 
That was a lot of fun, man. I, tell you. <laughs> I just want to say one thing about the, what I really love about Peter's paintings, especially, I think all of them here have this kind of incredible filter. It, it's a, it's a, uh, something even from kind of, I don't know, Renaissance painting, the way of generating light, and he uses the, the thin white as a filter, and the, it, it creates this luminosity that comes through it, and it's really, it's like the paintings are, they, they're, they're clear, they, they have a clear idea, and they function in a very dynamic way, and I think that's rare, and I really, I, I, I'm, uh, you know, sort of awed by the quality, let's say. I don't want to go too crazy on you, but I just, uh, you know, they're really quite uh, spectacular. Thanks. Thanks. They're, they're, in fact, easier than they look to make. Really? Um, kind of, yeah. They're, you know, they... That feels kind of counterintuitive. I, I feel like artists are always, you know, you'll see something and they'll be like, this took me a year to sort this yeah, out. No, it, 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 it takes me much less time than that. Um, <laughs> I mean, they, they, there are tricks involved, of course, and they're the same tricks that, that Rembrandt used to, to you know, uh, would you make share, light. Would you share one of them with us? Uh, Blair's shaking no, his just, head I mean, no. It's, it's, painting one, it's painting 101, basically. You know, it's just, it's painting Well, we talked about that you use a little um, looking glass sometimes to see them without color. Could you speak to that? Yeah, no, I, I don't use it, but there's something called a clawed glass, which, which especially in the Impressionist uh, days, it was a, a tool that artists used, and it's a piece of black obsidian. And if you look at at the reflection of the painting, you basically see it in black and white. Nice. And you hear about the, the Abex guys squinting or, or you know, looking at the painting upside down in order to, to get a, a fresh look at it. And um, is there a 21st century version of that in your I, mind? In a way, uh, I, I paint these, in, my, my studio is really, really dark. And so I paint these in the dark. 99% of the time, I know what they're going to look like when they end up in a, in a room like this. Um, but nevertheless, it, it, when they're in the studio, I partly have to use my imagination in order to see them clearly. Do you, do you have any um, methods you want to speak to like that? I'll give you a simple secret that anybody can use, which is you just pretend that you're somebody, a child or a relative or a really good friend or uh, someone you're really in love with and you make them a painting that's really great for them and it's, you're gonna make the best painting you can make and you, all your feelings are summed up in that and then you just don't send it to them and you don't tell them about it. And that's a way of focusing It's a way of kind of stripping away the, the jobbiness of the job and getting to more, uh, a better painting, let's say. I don't know, that's, a, that's one of my little silly secrets. It sounds a bit like a greeting card, but uh, it's a good trick. Um, you just don't, like I've done that with you many times. So. <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've made a lot of paintings. Well, Bill. I think that's interesting though that that's kind <laughs> of speaking you. about like motivation or, um, Intent. Well, you know, because I'm a, a, a sort of famously bad painter. I mean, it's kind of the the the, the dangerous side of showing with Peter is, I'm uh, you know I'm not I'm not building up a magical anything. You know, it's just kind of very very bad painting, and somehow I figured out a way to make that work with what I do. Thank God. But uh, and you know, I, I if I try to paint uh, sort of realistic, I don't know figures or whatever, I can, I can do it, but I prefer this and, and this is what I do and now there's like a, the beauty for me is at some point I got kind of permission to paint through figuring out a kind of a theory and that, and since then I, I have enough paintings that there's a kind of a generations of it for me. So I know, I kind of know sort of where I'm going mm -hmm. and I can, I feel that I still have permission to do, sometimes go back and do things that I did before and it's, uh, again, it's, it's that sentimentality. You know, you're thinking about that old painting that was really good, 
and you try to do another one that's different but like that one and sort of could be its grandson or whatever. So it's a mental, uh, yeah. it's a head, head thing. Roberta Smith will say, if you're lucky, you can escape your influences as a young painter. And I was wondering, did you guys feel there were influences or heroes for you that you had to kind of break that trajectory early on? Yeah, for me, it was really, really early that I, that I let go of, 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 of any of that kind of bondage. Um, I'm at my best when I let my paintings decide. I'm, I'm at my best when I get out of the way. Um, I certainly, I get into trouble when I start thinking about things. I get into real bad trouble when I have ideas. <laughs> um, if I have an idea that works, it's an idea that I should have had years ago. Like, oh man, why, why didn't I think of this before? And uh, I'm, I'm not sure it's me thinking of it. It, it. The paintings really do have a life of their own. Each painting decides what the next painting is gonna look like. And, mm -hmm. and, and the hardest part of my job is, is listening to, to that voice, is, is, or, or allowing that voice to, to have some traction. It's very difficult not to get in the way, especially when it starts to work. Or also, if it doesn't work, then of course, who's the asshole, you know? <laughs> um, I think the trick for me, again, is the same kind of thing. You probably can figure out what I'm gonna say. I, I don't, I, I kind of embrace the influences and uh, as long as I've convinced myself that I'm on the other side of not, uh, so that I'm not ripping them off, yeah, I, I feel like I'm actually thinking. Can about, you tell me who well, a couple of those would be? Well, Kenneth Nolan, absolutely. Steve, obviously, Steve Perino. Um, I got a lot, and all the Italians, uh, uh, Skeggy, uh, Castellani, uh, all the great uh, con art concrete. I believe it's called. But uh, you know, I love that whole movement, and they're and they're really so Fontana, obviously, but. Uh, um, I think you have to kind of, you have to be worried, I, I, I'm sort of maybe the opposite, I worry about that stuff and, and, I, and I try to... You're saying you worry about letting go of the steering wheel? No, I don't want to get too close to, uh, you know, well, say Richard Prince, for example, you know, I do sort of some very automotive related things. Uh, I actually used to do paintings of cars and slot cars a long, long time ago and there's, you know, because he has such a giant uh, body, body of work, yeah. I have to kind of, I feel like I live in a sort of a little, like nice adobe thing on the edge of this huge Italian estate with like uh, olive trees and everything and I can't get too close to the wall, you know, where it becomes the Richard Prince villa or whatever. So that's, that's an example. Uh, and I have to, I have to try to avoid that. But if I, once I've avoided that, I'm very happy to, uh, kind of celebrate the, I have a painting called No Land Like Show Land, which is basically Nolan colors that I borrowed from a postcard somewhere mm -hmm. and made one of my uh, track paintings out of. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a love letter basically. So I don't know, I feel all right about that. How do you guys decide on the scale of a painting? There was maybe three different sizes of, of paintings of yours in this show. And I'm just curious when you're starting off, because I know I've seen some, some works on paper, do you start them as studies and then no. decide what size no, it's gonna I be? I don't start them as studies. And the, the size is, again, something that I don't wanna think about. So, and it, it doesn't matter that much to me. Um, these days, my, I work in, a, in quite a small studio, so that has bearing on the size of my paintings. But mostly, I have, I have some sizes that I like to work on. That decision's been made, and I don't have to think about it. It's one less thing to get, yeah. to get busy with. Do they operate differently to you if it's a square versus a rectangle? They do, absolutely, yeah, sure, yeah. And how does that, I mean, 
I, I don't know if there's language around it, but how, how does that impact? I guess it's kind of a figurative thing. Um, it's only recently that I've started making horizontal paintings. I, I don't, I haven't made a lot of horizontal paintings. They're usually, I see it as sort of figurative. Um, if, it's, if it's a vertical or a square. Yeah, yeah. Um, if it's a vertical, I guess, a, a, I, I don't know, but it's, yeah, it's different. Sometimes there can be, in, in some paintings, almost a suggestion of a figure. Do you think of those as figurative paintings for yeah, you? Yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah. I mean, only because they end up looking like uh, figures, ba you know, vaguely. Um, and, and, and I have, at times, appropriated uh, images and, and situations, like a happy face. I've made a number of happy face paintings. Mm -hmm. um, or Robert Indiana's Love, I've appropriated that a number of times. Just convenient things, but, but they don't really function as, a, as an homage. They just like, okay, that decision's been made, I don't have to think about that anymore. Mm -hmm. So again, it's, it's a process of distillation for me. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the thing that I, I really take credit for in the paintings is the wrist action, is, is my, my, my fingers. Blair, you don't, the, people don't really live in your world these days. Oh, there's a lot of like childhood objects, so maybe it's kind of a, a child or whatever. I mean, the, the, the thing that I think people think of as speakers is really the eyes of, a, of an old uh, kite. It was a thing called a bat kite, and it's a sticker. And uh, I like stickers because they, there's something, I, know, I liked them as a kid. I used to collect the auto stickers and I liked the graphic. And uh, so stickers are one of the things that I consider sort of pre-art history. You know, I, I, I went to school during the kind of postmodernist uh, time and also neo-expressionism. Instinctively, I just didn't like the idea that you could sort of study and build a painting from uh, you know, combining two different eras and just plugging it together somehow. And I wanted to, I told myself at that time when I was young that I wanted to find something that I could say was, that it had not been uh, sort of um, didactified or whatever, uh, not, not turned into a, a, a process, a school process. So, I don't know, is that an answer? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it's funny that both of you have, because I know Peter has talked to me that, I think you said that you have old notebooks or something as a kid, and that you were kind of making uh, drawings that you can trace back from oh, your as work a, as, a, as a little kid, yeah, I recently found some school books with drawings of ziggurats and, and, and shapes that, yeah, I was really surprised to see those. So I, yeah, I got started real early. And do you have kind of um, uh, like studio um, language around different shapes? Like I think, is it Art Schwager who used to call his, his like stretched out shape a blip? Is that what, there's, there's, anybody? There's a zip, isn't there? Or that's somebody else. Uh, yeah, it's something like that. Somebody else does the zips, do you remember? Who that is? Barnett Newman? Yeah, 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 yeah that's yeah, right. So, but do you, have, do you have terms like that that you use in, in the studio to identify I, certain shapes? Or? I don't think so. Okay. Beyond circle. <laughs> <laughs> Perception is interpretation. That sometimes we like to think that how we perceive something is the no filter kind of raw data um, you know, we're drinking something in and then we'll interpret it, that, but, but that really we're interpreting things as we perceive them. I, I think I, I, I imagine that I, I don't give people a choice how they see my painting. But I think that's in my imagination maybe. But, uh -huh. but I really, I, I try to, um, Almost uh, limit the deconstructionist yeah. possibilities of it. Yes, yeah, but yeah. I think you can see that. I think that's what I was reaching for when I just said, you know, they're really clear. The idea mm -hmm. is clear, and that's that's really rare. I think it's not uh, it's sort of formal abstraction. It's it's a uh, it's it's it can go it's wrong. Nuanced. 
it can go wrong. I mean, uh, 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 Jer Jerry Saltz wrote about my work. He said that he hates himself for liking my paintings as much as he does. And um, I, feel I get like that. that's a compliment. I, I, I took it as one. <laughs> yeah. I, I took it as one because I, I don't want to give him a, give him a choice. Yeah. Um, but we touched on that a little bit earlier as well about. Uh, I, th I think it is important how, how pictures look, look back at us, the, the attitude of, a, of a, a painting on the wall, whether it, it looks at you with uh, confidence or with uh, empathy or, or fear um, or, or whatever. They, they, you know, Emerson wrote about that in, in Self-Reliance. He, he, I mean, he, was, he was going for the sort of confidence that if you're going to be a great artist that, that, that you're your um, your work should 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 look at an audience with this notion that the audience is is lucky to be there. Um, I, I I think there's there's uh, there's more than just confidence. I've seen a lot of paintings that look at you with great humility, and and they're also you know uh, beautiful, Morandi or I don't know, uh, take your pick. They do look back at us. Do you feel like painting, like attitude, is is important with paintings? I mean, I think I think that. Uh, well, I'm we can, it yeah, absolutely. It, well, I think he, he's talking about the same thing I'm saying, really, which is that the the, the painting that it has to ha it has to have an it has to be it has to have an identity it has to reach a certain level of force to be uh, to to because the object of the painting is not to just go away somewhere and come back out. It's supposed to be with people. It's the, it's that future, what it does, what it's designed to do. Like what, why do you get a painting? You know, and then, and if you get a painting that really works and the, you know, this is a class, these are classic examples of paintings that really function, then you have an experience that's, you know, what it's all about basically. Is that a good amount of time then? You feel good about it? All right, well, I want to thank Peter Schuf, Blair Thurman, um, for participating in uh, the Pink Noise show. I and thought Pink Noise, when I first heard it, I thought it was, it was so like, like in the 80s, there was, there was this whole gay uh, activist move, uh, thing. And, and <laughs> <laughs> or, or something religious, maybe. Anyhow, it's physics. <laughs> Rest easy. All right, thanks everyone for, for coming. Thank you. Thank you.